Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Salah. I, I'm really uh, very happy to have uh, uh, our colleagues, cardiologists, with us for the first time. We hope that there will be collaboration because we will work on the same show and we will be able to do a lot of work. Dr. Ayman, I'm very happy that you gave me the opportunity to talk about this topic. It's very, very common, whether in nephrology or cardiology. We know that diuretics are universally uh, prescribed for patients in congestive heart failure. Uh, but in spite of this, really, we don't have any proven uh, effects on the survivor, although they are very, very beneficial in relieving symptoms related uh, to congestion. I have to take you to this slide just to point to the fact that the cardiorenal syndrome type 1, which is what we are dealing with in this particular uh, situation, usually it's a proxy of hemoconcentration rather than a direct uh, affection of the filtration rate. But yes, occasionally there is uh, worsening of the renal functions due to the use of aggressive uh, loop uh, diuretic therapy. Uh, to the right-hand side of the slide, you can find a recent publication by McLeod last January stating that with the IV uh, diuretic use in such conditions, patients do not show any evidence at all, any markers of tubular infection. And what happens is when there is worsening renal functions, it is related to the hypoperfused kidneys. No definition, no consensus of opinion regarding the definition, and there are various definitions, as you can see in the blue box. Generally speaking, diuretic resistance is a state, you are giving a patient a full dose of diuretics and you are not getting enough uh, uh, diuretics. This is simply saying it. Diuretic resistance is looked at as a predictor of mortality, yes, but I wouldn't say that diuretic resistance is any cause uh, of mortality, but it is a predictor because it's happening in the worst patients. In this condition, it would happen with patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. We always see it in the very difficult cases that really have a high uh, probability of death. And loop diuretics in heart failure are very beneficial, as you can see from this uh, diagram. It decongests patients, it relieves symptoms, but on the other hand, you may, have, you may face a breaking phenomenon that, that I will come to explain. Electrolyte imbalances definitely are not uncommon. The, the problem with increased uh, RAS activity and the systemic vasoconstriction that happens leads to worsening of renal functions. Uh, I'd like just to remind you how diuretics are working before talking about uh, uh, the resistance. Uh, diuretics have to be bound in the circulation to uh, albumin. So in any cases of hypoalbuminemia, uh, it will be uh, a cause for diuretic resistance. Uh, to go into the lumen of the capillary, they don't pass at all through uh, the glomerulus, but rather the peritubular uh, capillaries around the proximal tubules, S1 and S3. They bind to uh, the organic anion transporter and another protein uh, known as the multidrug resistant protein number four and occasion number one as well. By that, they are delivered through uh, the walls of the columnar epithelium and reach the lumen of uh, the tubules. They go up to the thick loop of Henry where they bind to their specific uh, receptor, which is the sodium potassium chloride symporter. This symporter is also present in the proximal computed uh, tubule as well as present in many areas of the body and maybe to your interest in the ear. That's why we face sometimes with high doses of diuretics a reversible autotoxicity. This, this uh, portal which is uh, the ionic, uh, organic ionic uh, transporter uh, is competed for by the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or of the endogenous uremic toxins say that you are treating a patient with chronic kidney disease or advanced uremia. The diuretic will not be able to pass because both of these things compete for binding uh, sites uh, of entry into uh, the lumen of the tubules. 
And this is just a reminder of where various, loop, uh, various diuretics act, and I'm concentrating on uh, the loop diuretics today and the thiazide diuretics as well that are working on uh, the distal convoluted tubules. And just to show you here that there is caloresis and natureses as well as wasting of chloride. Causes of diuretic resistance may be due to patient non-compliance or he's taking too much salt or too much water or he's very old or in a case of nephrotic syndrome with, with, a, with a lot of protein wasting in the renal tubules because this would bind all uh, the available uh, diuretic. And just to give you a glimpse of what's happening, what's wrong, what goes wrong when a patient is severely congested and he has an increased center of venous pressure, then uh, this could be possibly a, a cause leading to uh, diuretic failure or diuretic resistance. The gut is congested. Edema is everywhere. Mind you, uh, frucemide is very well known to be affected by gut edema. Uh, in its absorption, while trusomide or butanamide, which are the other two loop diuretics, are not affected by this condition. Hence, sometimes when we face a state of resistance, we may like to shift from one loop to diuretic to the other. Another point I just said, which is cases of hypoalbuminemia, which is commonly present in uh, nephrotic syndrome, for example. The reduced filtration meaning that uh, all the capillaries around the proximal renal tubules will also be constricted due to the uh, enhanced activity or the increased activity of the RAS together with the generalized uh, sympathetic nervous system vasoconstriction is also another cause. Proximal tubular uh, reabsorption of sodium occurs in a breaking phenomena. I will come to explain this in a while. And I also mentioned that the organic uh, uh, iron transporters could be competed for by uh, non-steroidal anti drugs or urinic toxins. So this is an added, uh, another added factor. And uh, finally, uh, the, at the distal uh, proximal tubular level, we can say a prox uh, the breaking phenomena would also be a cause for the occurrence of this condition. What is diuretic breaking? Simply, you are giving a patient the rest for a very long time, the tubules are overworking, they start to hypertrophy. So not all the symporters will be saturated by the diuretic, and the other symporters will do the normal physiological role of reabsorbing sodium. That's one of the causes of diuretic resistance. Uh, Zachary and uh, Tastani looked at uh, diuretic resistance in this interesting way, whether it's a pre state, and this is associated with hypoalbuminemia uh, or excessive salt and water intake, or an intranephron di uh, diuretic resistance at the pre-loop of Henley uh, stage, where there is competition for the transporters by, let's say, uremic toxins or uh, the analgesics. And at the loop of Henley itself, and this happens due to poor binding in cases of hypoproteinuria, uh, I mean proteinuria, which is going to bind to the diuretic, and eventually the last step, which is the post-loop of Henley, this is the breaking phenomenon. Okay. These are the strategies I'm going to go through to show you how we can handle this condition. Uh, dietary sodium, uh, we all understand very well that uh, restricting salt is something very important, but sometimes it is overdone, and this overdoing of salt restriction would result in hyponatremia as well as hypochloremia, which will also be associated with alkalosis. And in this condition in particular, if you are sure that this is true hyponatremia, when you check the plasma osmolality and you find evidence of true hyponatremia, you would need to give the patient a high uh, concentration of saline, no more than 1.4%. Resistance to diuretic is mostly demonstrated uh, uh, and demonstrated to be linked to an upregulation of the sodium uh, reabsorption and the distal tubules. And uh, this article just uh, explains the, 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 the use 
or the need occasionally of giving the patients the hypertonic saline 1.4% in concomitance with giving the patients loop uh, diuretic. Chlorides, yes. Chloride levels are very important and if you do not maintain normal uh, chloride, uh, you have a serious problem related to activation of the RAS and high chloride levels are good because they reduce the renin release so when you are confronted with a case of hypochloremia, which is normal up to 1.7 millimoles, you would, uh, 107 I mean, you would need to infuse the patient with a lysine chloride or a sodium-free uh, chloride saline, that's what it is. It will restore the chloride back to normal and improve a lot of the cardiorenal uh, associated parameters. What do you like to give the patient loop diuretics to get a good uh, action? Yes, you can give the loop diuretic continuously, infusing the patient continuously, or shots. Uh, if you're using furosemide, you know that the half-life is short, two, point, two and a half hours, so uh, you have to do it so frequently. Maybe furosemide is up to six hours. Anyway, whether you're giving it on a continuous infusion basis or shots, it doesn't make much difference. And looking at these graphs, it will just say that you can see the convergence lacks any kind of uh, significance, so uh, whether you do it like this or that, there's no much difference. And regarding uh, the dosage, if you are using low dose or high dose, again, uh, there is no significant difference. And regarding the worsening of the renal functions, uh, although there is apparent uh, variability between uh, the bolus and the continuous and the low dose and the high dose yet lack any uh, significance uh, at all. Combined diuretic therapy, you would like to do uh, this when you really exhaust yourself and you find no response to uh, the loop diuretic you are using, then we are doing what is known as sequential blockade. You are blocking the receptors as the urine goes up to the distal convoluted tubule, so you would like to add a thiazide diuretic, for example. Uh, occasionally, you would need to give aldosterone agents, particularly uh, anti-aldosterone agents such as epiurinone or spironolactone uh, in heart failure. But mind you, we deal so much with CKD and using these particular uh, potassium sparing diuretics, if you're not watching the patient uh, uh, really close, you may get into trouble with states of hyperkalemia. Combined, combined therapy, this publication I came across just says that when you, before thinking about combining diuretics and giving uh, patients two forms, you better maximize the loop diuretic dose first. And there, actually, there is no upper ceiling. Uh, and any toxicity, such as the autotoxicity, uh, is quite reversible. So you have to maximize the loop diuretic dose before thinking about uh, giving a, another uh, type of diuretic. And this recent publication showed that combining different forms of diuretics with a loop diuretic showed no uh, difference between the groups, whether you're using uh, metuzalone or chlorothiazide or even tolvaptan. And this takes me to tolvaptan. And many years ago, there was the Everest uh, outcome trial that was initially designed to see any benefits on uh, mortality, long-term mortality in heart failure patients when they were treated by tolvaptan. The results were negative. And right now, according to this recent publication by Mazila et al., Torvaptan doesn't re present a therapeutic option for heart failure, except in cases with severe hyponitrine. But you, if you are going to give it uh, for this particular point, watch out because Torvaptan can correct sodium quickly and you may end up or face uh, a serious condition, clinical situation, you all know, related to hypernatremia. As you do inhibitors, fantastic drugs for diabetes and benefits in the heart. We have the Credence we, uh, trial and we have the Campus trial. This is very good. And there is an ongoing trial now called, especially for nephrology, called uh, the DAPA CKD trial that is supposed to uh, tell us uh, the situation of using these drugs in non-diabetic CKD patients and preventing uh, progression. Of course, we understand that they are weak diuretics, but I have no data uh, 
uh, at all concerning their use in the retic resistance, but I believe if a patient is using it, that's good for him. The retic resistance, uh, I've got two more slides, uh, maybe due to medication non-adherence, failure to restrict salt or water intake, maybe your patient is receiving uh, analgesics, or you're not giving the patient just enough diuretic. Some, some doctors are inclined to increase the dose, they are afraid of toxicities, uh, but this is the situation, you have to increase the dose until you get an effective response. And then, if you fail, you may think of adding a thyroid diuretic, as I showed you before. And in conclusion, if you are using a loop diuretic and you're not getting uh, a good enough response, you may like to change, if you are using furosemide, you may change to butinamide, uh, butanide or uh, torsemide, for example, and eventually you'd like uh, to add uh, a thyroid or a mineral called receptor, but I caution you if you are prescribing these medications for a patient with CKD. Uh, you may give intravenously the, th the diuretic in a continuous infused form or give it uh, intermittently, just what, what is more available and what is easier for both the patient and yourself. When you are confronted with cases of uh, severe hyponatremia, you would resort to using hypertonic uh, saline uh, in association with the, the loop diuretics. Uh, I can't really uh, recommend the use of Vaptans, uh, not just because they are very expensive, but the loop diuretics and the cyanide will do a good job, uh, except in certain conditions when the problem is just simply uh, water. I'm ending the talk with this algorithm. I'm not going to uh, read it because it's very uh, complicated. And if I read it, you will not digest it. Uh, the presentation already is going to be on the ECT side. If you are interested to have a look and because this summarizes all what I've said. And uh, I think I'm on time and I've got uh, some more minutes. We can keep them to the discussion. I thank you all for your kind listening.